keto freaks. Here's an update on Keto Fest. Keto Fest is a ketogenic festival for everyone. Richard Morris and I, along with a host of keto rock stars you probably know, are turning the entire coastal town of New London, Connecticut, ketogenic for a whole weekend next July. At least we hope it'll be next July. The actual date won't be confirmed until mid-January. You want talks by some of the hottest names in keto? Some of the best and brightest minds have already said they want to come, including Jimmy Moore, Megan Ramos, Ivor Cummins, Dr. Jeff Gerber, Dr. Eric Westman, and Dr. Ted Naiman. We hope to have a bacon bar going all day long during the talks. Knowledge and bacon. Ah. But we're going to do much more than sit in on these great talks. How about an outdoor pig roast? Cooking classes, fitness classes, walking tours, segue tours, and of course, live music and hanging out with fellow Ketonians. Several restaurants and bars in the neighborhood have offered up a special keto menu that includes low-carb potables, chicken wings, and fathead pizza. Wouldn't a fathead pizza truck be the best ever? Yeah, I'm talking a portable brick oven all weekend long. Well, we're going to have a Kickstarter in March to sell tickets. Meantime, add your name to the mailing list at ketofest.com. KetoFest, real keto for real people. Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm about 80 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia, and I've been on a ketogenic diet for over two years. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of studying ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've also lost about 80 pounds and have completely turned my health around. And this show is a document of my progress through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in ketosis. Yeah. And hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Nah. We have done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind that. Uh, we hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite research supporting any claims that we make. You'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Yeah. We love to cook and we love to eat. Sure do. In every episode, we both share a keto recipe that cannot be ignored. <laughs> we certainly do. All right, Richard, let's start podcast number 44, Carnivore. Carnivore. Are we up to 44? Are we up to 44 already? We are up to 44, my friend. That's incredible. Do we have any corrections or apologies from last week, Richard? Uh, no, I think we actually did a pretty good show last week. Mm -hmm. This is my 44th podcast. I think this is your 1,300th or something. I, I, yeah, closer to 2,000 probably. Yeah, you're an old hand. Yeah. Jeez. All right, well, let's recap what a ketogenic diet is. Yeah, it's uh, under 20 grams of carbohydrates a day, uh, protein scales with lean body mass. Uh, for us, it's been 1 to 1 1.5 grams per kilogram of lean body mass. And then we get all of our energy from fat. And uh, it's either the fat that's on your plate or the fat that's from that Krispy Kreme that you ate a decade ago. Yeah, I saw somebody in our forum today post uh, a Krispy Kreme with glazing around the outside done in the elvish characters of the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So that, so that, that is one precious uh, <laughs> Krispy Kreme donut. So how was your week, Richard? Uh, short and sharp. I went to see my doctor and blew her mind. Yeah. I told her about uh, my trick of eating uh, uh, 5,000 kilocalories of macadamias and uh, bending all of the needles of my uh, lipid uh, uh, biomarkers all to the good. And next time she wants me to not do that and just uh, confirm that uh, it was the intervention that made the change and it's not a, a gradual improvement in my, uh, right. uh, my lipids. You do the positive test and then you do the negative test. And then you can sort of narrow it down. It's just science. Yeah. 
That's good. I've got two referrals now from her to get DEXA scans. So I'm all ready for this quarter. I'm going to get uh, two DEXA scans, bookending an experiment where I'm going to drive my protein intake right down to the Australian nutrient reference value levels. And I'm going to see exactly what that does to my uh, lean body mass. So, and the other interesting thing is uh, for the first time ever, I'll know precisely what my lean body mass is because the DEXA scan uh, is going to be able to calculate that. Fantastic. So that's my week. How was yours, Carl? I had an awesome week, Richard. Um, It was highlighted by a post that I made on Facebook on my personal page and in the Two Keto Dudes group going viral in my little corner of the internet anyway. Oh, yeah. It went off, didn't it? Yeah. I posted a before and after picture, a 12-month before and after picture. Um, The first one was at 366 pounds, and the second one was 80 pounds lighter at uh, 286 and the difference is really striking when you put them together. Yeah. And in the graphic, I said what my weight and HbA1c were then and now, and uh, and just in big bold letters, you know, twelve months of ketogenic eating. That's incredible. And uh, that's that's all I put. I didn't go into detail. And friends that I haven't heard from in years, who had been following me, you know, a little bit, and with a little interest, now are saying, you know. I, I'm convinced. Get I me did, some of this. Yeah, I got to get me some of this. It was about one year into my transition where you started talking to me about this. So that's right. A year it gives you a good chance to show that it's not uh, a temporary transition. Yeah. You know your posts about specifically how the modern medical establishment gives you the opposite advice, right? And how you know you not only thrive doing this, but in fact, yeah cleared yourself of disease markers. I think that's the power of it, you know, and that that's what made me pay attention. Yeah. So that was just a a great, amazing thing. Another thing I did was I scheduled a first meetup in my local area at meetup.com. Nice. And you can go to this meetup if you just want to see it's at NL for new London, nl.2keto.com. And uh, after this um, whole viral post locally, I've got 39 members and 11 people (laughs) are coming to the first meetup this coming Saturday. Wow. Well done. That is awesome. Yeah. I think it's great. And that's what we encourage other people to do. In fact, I just got this tweet from Denise Tinsley who said, Carl Franklin, I'm so glad I saw your tweet about the ketogenic diet. Migraines are gone and down 13 pounds in two months. That's outstanding. Yeah. I did. I actually uh, did one other thing this week that I forgot to mention in my bit, and that was uh, one of my friends, Shane, who was on our 42nd episode, uh, who um, lost uh, 100 pounds from a wheelchair. Yeah. Now, one of his uh, school friends is actually one of the medical specialists who's treating him and looking after his, his uh, nerve conduction mm. testing. And uh, he was interested in the ketogenic diet, so Shane decided to have a meetup where he made fathead pizza and basically made a full keto meal yeah. uh, for, uh, for this guy and his wife. Both of them, his he is his wife is an exercise physiologist, um, and he is uh, I forget the precise specialization that he has, but he uh, he looks after Shane's nerve conduction testing. Neat. So anyway, um, they brought me in via Skype, and I had a virtual dinner with them. Wow! So they basically put a laptop at the end of the table, <laughs> and I, we got cameras going, and we had a good chat about keto while they ate. Uh, a fathead pizza. That's going to be a great cottage industry for us here, you know. No, no. <laughs> Invite us to dinner via Skype. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic, Richard. Mm. Uh, and, and again, we want to urge people to don't keep this great stuff to yourself. Go out and change somebody's life. Yeah. Um, they'll thank you forever for it. Yeah, first change yourself. And then once you've successfully made that transition, help your family and friends and then help them to help their friends. And if you do that, uh, you just all you have to do is change two people's lives and they have to change two people's lives and eventually we're going to change a, a, a grassroots rebellion. Okay. So before we go any further, I want to throw this out there uh, to our group and see if anybody's interested in this. I th- Richard and I want to find somebody who has committed to using a ketogenic lifestyle to overcome type 2 diabetes and obesity uh, and who has those markers of metabolic syndrome and who hasn't started yet. And yeah. and then track their progress and bring them on the show before they start, before they start day one of keto, 
uh, talk about their history, talk about their numbers, their blood work, all of that stuff. Make sure they've got a blessing from their medical professional. Sure. And then follow their progress every week and see how they're doing. That's what a great idea. It was interesting for me. Yeah. But, you know, we'd like to find somebody with a completely different demographic than, you know, two overweight white guys. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, we'd like to find, you know, perhaps a a, a woman, perhaps somebody who isn't white, um, perhaps somebody who is in a different culture sure. that uh, you know has different challenges than we face, um, and and just you know, let's celebrate them and their progress and see if uh, see what happens. That's outstanding. So if you know somebody who falls into that category and wants to do this, get them in touch with us. Dudes at two keto dudes dot com. Sure. All right, then. I think it's time to read some mail. We're just and we don't need no mail. <laughs> mail. Okay, I'm going to go first. So uh, this is a message that was in our Facebook forum, and you can fa- find our Facebook forum at fb.2keto.com. Yep. And as of this particular moment, there is 9,906 members. Wow. So we are very close to 10K. So this message is from Jim, and he says, As the captain of a tugboat, it is my job to type up and submit a weekly grocery order. We're a crew of four, and I'm the only one on keto. I usually let the guys fill out the list with whatever we need or want, and then I type up an email to the office. (laughs) Um, The further into keto, the harder this is for me. I really see what I used to eat, but maybe that's a good thing. I don't ever want to go back to eating ding-dongs, (laughs) Pop-Tarts, Little Debbies, Fritos, Cokes, cookies, potatoes, corn oil, sugar, bread, cereal, margarine, and all manner of frozen processed junk you could imagine, and on and on ad nauseum. I cannot judge or preach. Up until recently, I was eating this junk also. Uh, But if not for this forum, I would feel so alone, so I will just keep calm and keto on. Oh, I feel for you, Jim. Oh, yeah. You're set up to feel like an outsider, an outcast, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's an epiphany once you once you realize uh, what this food was doing to you. Yeah. Uh, and you look back over the food that you were eating. I look back at some of my MyFitnessPal um, uh, food diaries from before I went keto. Mm. And, you know, I had entire days where I only ate fruit. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. this, this, it's insane. So, yeah, it is. Anyway. And uh, also makes you realize that, you know, I, I think I had this epiphany several shows in, maybe three or four shows in, mm. where I said, you know, I just had this idea today that nutritional ketosis is the default metabolic state of human beings. It has to be because of um, how we evolved without all these carbohydrates. Right. And that really speaks to the heart of what Amber is going to talk about today. So I won't go into that. I'll let her talk about it. Mm. All right. Let's read another piece of mail here, also from our Facebook group. Sure. This one's from Carolyn. Uh, she says, I wrote up my own little pamphlet that promotes and explains the ketogenic diet. I always have copies with me in case someone starts talking about losing weight or their health problems. Mm. Even if someone is rude to me about what I'm eating, I am happy that God opened a door for me to talk to share the fountain of youth with. <laughs> I saw the bell ringer at the store today. So this is a somebody ringing bells and getting donations at Christmas time, right? Yeah, Salvation Army. I decided to see if I could give her one. I said, I will give you a dollar if you take my flyer. Wow. She said, yes, I love flyers. (laughs) Who are these people? Wow. (laughs) That's never happened to me, Richard. I I can never start that conversation. I'm not one to take flyers either. I, I can't stand it. So I'm really amazed that this person said, I love flyers. Yeah. So she goes on, Carolyn goes on to say, the first line on my flyer is, do you want to lose fat? She said, I need to lose fat. I have to lose 30 pounds so I can have the stomach surgery to lose weight. Oh, oh dear. Uh. I was able to tell her all about it and give her the flyer. I'm going to have to get more details and get more flyers and see if this works on more bell ringers. <laughs> <laughs> this is a uh. big opportunity for everyone out there who sees a bell ringer, yeah. she says. If you don't have your own flyer, I'm happy to email you a PDF of mine. It doesn't promote anything but the ketogenic diet. Send me an email and I'll send you the PDF. Wow, Carolyn. That's awesome. Yeah. What a great idea. Like I've always had trouble. How do you start that conversation? Because um, I don't want to walk up to a stranger and say, look, I noticed you're fat. 
Yeah. Maybe I've got something that can help you. I mean, it's it's hard. Th- that's a crazy person coming up to you. Right. We've we've had this conversation before. Um, I made up a flyer with my before and after picture in just a few sentences. Right. But I didn't say, do you want to lose fat? Because that sounds like the hook that they all use, you know, to sell stuff. Yeah. And I, I can't remember what mine said, but it was something like, I lost 80 pounds of reverse diabetes with no drugs, just eating real food. That. And then the picture. And then if they're interested enough from my experience to read on, I start with, I don't have anything to sell you. Nah. That's what I lead with. I'm not selling anything. Uh, I just feel compelled to share what I know with everybody else. Are you interested? Take a picture of this flyer because everybody's got a phone, right? Yeah. You don't need to have little stubs with phone numbers on them. Just take a picture of this flyer. It's got the URL on it and then we're off to the races. And I found that to be real effective. Okay, we have one last mail, and that is from Aaron, who says, what would you guys say are the signs of true hunger on keto? Sometimes I'm able to fast for about 16 hours, but towards the end, my extremities get cold, I lose my physical energy, my mental clarity is flagging, and my stomach makes horrible rumbling sounds. I've often heard it discussed in this community that there are differences between true hunger and psychological hunger. So how do we know which one's the former? Does it have to do with body composition? Since I'm lean, does my body send me stronger signals that it needs energy than if I had more energy stored? Mm. And that's really interesting. And I, I think, uh, I think we, might, uh, we might open that up to our guest, Amber. Uh, what do you think about uh, the question about the difference between true hunger and psychological hunger? That is an interesting question. Some people say that if you're feeling hungry, it's because you need more fat. And some people say if you're Mm. feeling hungry, it's because you need more protein. And it's hard to say Mm. which of those is true. Or nutrients. Or nutrients, right. Yeah. And of course, the psychological component would be something like, I'm used to eating right now, or I've just seen some food. And so that makes me feel hungry. I have also fasted for periods of a day or two and have experienced that energy beginning to flag or maybe headaches even. And I would take that as a sign of physiological hunger. But my my own experience of hunger is that I don't get hungry until I start to eat. Once mm. I start to eat, my appetite kicks in and then I can eat for a very right. long time. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Richard did some research that we talked about in the protein controversy mm. where he uh, talked about the limit of your body to burn fat based on how much body fat you have. And so there's a cap on how many calories you can draw down on your body fat, depending on how much you have. And therefore, somebody who is uh, lean and doesn't have as much body fat and they're going to go into a fast They have to be more careful and probably need to take more fat. We also found that 18 hours, you know, where Aaron says 16 hours in, but, you know, 16, 18 hours seems to be the point at which people get hungry on a fast. Yeah, I think it might be uh, body fat, the contribution of body fat to your uh, energy requirements. Um, For example, uh, somebody who has uh, 20 pounds of body fat they each pound can generate uh, thirty one point five kilocalories per day, so they can generate about six hundred calories of it, of energy. Now, if you're used to burning twelve hundred or fifteen hundred or two thousand calories of energy, yeah, it's got it's a, bit, a little bit like uh, driving down the freeway at hundred kilometers an hour and all of a sudden hitting the brakes. You know, yeah. Um, so you you're going to notice that now. The reason I suspect that it happens later on in the day has to do with the fact that you've probably got circulating lipids in in your uh, lipoproteins already. So you have a store of energy in your blood and you're going to draw that down as well as um, any glycogen that you have uh, in your liver and in your muscles. uh, That's going to contribute to the amount of energy. But at some point in the fast, you get to the point where you are, are now only contributing energy to run your daily energy requirements mm. from body fat. And then it, however much body fat that you have is going to dictate how much uh, you can generate. Now, I've got about 60 pounds of body fat and I can generate about 1,890 uh, kilocalories per day. Now, that's a great day for me. You know, mm-hmm. two, that's about 2,000 calories a day. Yeah. I'm good. So I can fast. I've fasted for 10 days without any problems at all. Um, I can do exercise, moderate exercise within that uh 
uh, framework. So, you know, that, uh, and I don't feel the cold extremities and all of those sort of mm-hmm. symptoms. So um, I think that body fat does have something to do with it, uh, but we really need to learn these signals because these signals like hunger is a very important it's a primal um, yeah. uh, m- mechanism for for driving our behaviour and and dictating our survival, and so mm-hmm. um, I think it's a very important one to learn to uh, uh, get to know. Well, speaking of blood levels, that also mm. it also may be important. For instance, your insulin levels or your glucose levels in the blood. You you may have ah, the same yeah. amount of body fat as you did on a different diet, and if your blood levels of different hormones are in different states. That's going to affect how much your body's willing to release the fat from your fat cells. Mm, interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And you were just hearing Amber O'Hearn. Uh, let me introduce her for real. Amber O'Hearn has an MSc in computer science from the University of Toronto, where she studied computational linguistics. She has three active, healthy sons and no medical credentials, which she cites as an advantage because it reduces her temptation to say, trust me, I know what I'm talking about, which is, there's a lot of that out there on the internet. Uh, Instead, she shows you the evidence so you can judge for yourself, which, of course, is exactly what we like here at Two Keto Dudes. That's right in our wheelhouse, really, it is. Amber has eaten almost nothing but meat for over five years now, and her personal blog is at Empirica, that's E-M-P-I-R-I dot C-A, and her critical work is at ketotic.org, K-E-T-O-T-I-C dot org. And officially, welcome, Amber, to Two Keto Dudes. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I'm going to start just by saying uh, I went to ketotic.org and I watched the um, lecture that you gave at uh, this symposium on ancestral health, the ancestral health symposium. What was interesting is you didn't put references per se in the first few slides and you made some really bold statements. And I'm like, what, where's the science? Where's the science? And then I scroll down on your page and they're all, they're all there. All the references are there. Like homework done. Nice. Check it out. <laughs> science shown. I tried to be very careful with that. Thank you. Yes. It's so easy. Even, um, Things that I think I know because I've read them many times and when I go back and search the, the literature trying to figure out how I know what I know, sometimes it doesn't even pan out, yeah. even things I'm very sure of. So it's it's a common pitfall. Yeah, that happens to me all the time. Yeah, it, uh, it happened to me just the other day. I, I made a, 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 an assertion that uh, – uh, I can't remember, maybe it was every uh, percent increase in HbA1c was a 23% increase in lower extremity amputations and somebody challenged me on it and so I went actually looking for the science and found out that uh, I, I found out a nuance that I didn't realise about uh, that uh, statement. So, yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. And you have actually set up a, a sort of a framework for how you do science, haven't you? We call it end-to-end citations. Yeah. So I I was frustrated at one point when doing this kind of research to, to read articles that give a, a whole essay of claims and then just simply a list of citations at the end. And to be able to figure out which paper goes with which claim is hard enough. But mm-hmm. even if you do have that paper, the Sometimes the paper doesn't actually support what the author of the essay thinks it does support, or it's not obvious why they think it does. And so what I've tried to do is excerpt the exact part in the thing that I'm citing that shows what I believe it is showing. And then it's for me as well, because I'm bound to make mistakes. We're all learning here. And Mm. so if I can trace back the ideas where they came from, then if a mistake occurs, it'll be much easier to correct it by figuring out exactly where it came from. You know, it's just like a good computer programmer to comment their code. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe it's a unit test of sorts. Oh, (laughs) sorry. (laughs) Sorry, we're geeking out in another way here. (laughs) And in this uh, framework that that you talk about, and I believe the title of the blog post is Apologia, or Why We Do It This Way, you talk about applying the scientific method to your research and how you really have to be careful. And you say things like cite the evidence, don't overgeneralize, uh, and things like that. And I think we're going to link to this because I think everybody should read it. Uh, and it, it should really drive our conversations, especially online where people just tend to 
you know, give you offhand advice without backing it up. And then when you say, yeah, can you point me to some science? They get offended, you know, and say, Google it. Yeah, it can really be taken as a personal attack when someone points out an, a possible error in your thinking. And it's it's really important and difficult as a human to separate yourself from your work. And it's, yeah. yeah. Uh, I also, I want to acknowledge Zuko Wilcox's role in writing this and helping me come up with this way of approaching our work. Okay. So, Amber, how did you uh, come to a ketogenic diet in the first place? Well, I was brought up vegetarian, and I started to gain weight when I first went to university when I was around 20. And at that time, I heard of a low-carb diet, but I thought it was the most bizarre, obviously wrong thing I'd ever heard of, and I immediately dismissed it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I went on to double down on my efforts in vegetarianism. I tried veganism for a while. And then I went on a trip overseas to St. Petersburg. I was studying Russian at the time. Mm. And it was difficult to eat a vegetarian diet. And I capitulated and ate meat. And when I came back from my trip, I noticed that I was fitter than I had been before. Wow. And, I, right. and that seed that had been planted it was way back in in ninety two. There wasn't really the web, but there were there were fora. Um, Alt support diet had had two sub fora: Alt support diet low carb and Alt support diet low fat. Wow, we're and talking that, Usenet <laughs> here, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a long time a, ago. It was a long time ago, and so I thought, well, maybe I should look into that and see if there was something to it. And it was nineteen ninety seven, and the doctor's Eads had just published Protein Power. And so I bought right. that book and read it with avid interest and followed the references. I actually talk about a long time ago, I went to the library and looked at microfiche and looked up these papers that they had cited and thought, wow, there really is something to this. And I tried it and I immediately lost, I don't know, 20 or 30 pounds at the time, which had been bothering me for a long time. Nice. So I've been eating a low carb diet most of the time for almost 20 years. But what happened, and I don't really know exactly what happened, maybe it was a product of age, maybe it was because of pregnancies, but I began to steadily gain weight over time that even on my low-carb diet wasn't really going away. And then this had an impact on my resolve because – sure. If I would eat a, a low carb diet strictly and it maybe would cause me to lose a few pounds, but not lose all the weight that I knew I needed to lose. And then if I stopped and said, hell with this and had a big binge, <laughs> I would immediately start to gain. So I felt like I was always facing a losing proposition. Mm. It was very discouraging. Yeah. And it was also discouraging because I felt I had studied a lot about the effects of a ketogenic diet by that point. And I, I believed very firmly that the nutritional advice we'd been given for so long really was propaganda. And yeah. I felt like in my position of someone who could barely maintain a healthy weight didn't make me very credible. So all of this was really depressing. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I'll bet. In 2009, I was at this point of high frustration. And I happened to stumble upon a forum where people were eating only meat and were having a lot of weight loss success, even when they had previously been on a very low carb diet. And I thought, well, that's me. Hmm. And I thought this is something I could do. I could treat it like a kind of reset, um, lose that weight and then go back to my regular low carb diet that I knew was very healthy. I think many people who followed Atkins for so long felt the same way about the low carb diet. They would do that as a drastic measure. And he even said, you know, this is a corrective diet. I remember him saying that in his book, mm. that this is, we don't know the long-term effects of this. He still had hesitation. And so, you know, people saw this as a temporary fix. And a lot of people I know that did Atkins, they they got lazy and they didn't see it as a complete lifestyle change. And then they went back to their crappy garbage and gained weight back, which, you know, no diet is going to work unless you make a permanent change. 
I find it funny. I've seen many people comment that, oh, the diet doesn't work because as soon as you stop, the weight comes back on. <laughs> yes, yeah, stupid. I get people telling me this about diabetes. You know, I, I say to people, you know, I've reversed my diabetes by every marker that, that right. is known. And they say, oh, yeah, but if you just eat carby food, you're going to be a diabetic again. I say to them, if you, if you wind the clock back 50, 51 years and you look at me as a newborn, you could say categorically, knowing my future, that if this person eats a high-carbohydrate diet, they will become a diabetic. There's no difference between me now and that baby then, except you wouldn't say this baby is a diabetic. And so mm. you know, I say to people, you know, I'm not a diabetic as long as I eat the right diet. It's like, why should I take a shower every day? Because I'm just going to get smelly again. <laughs> Right. I love that point about diabetes because we it's the kind of disease where you you make some sort of cutoff point where once you start showing the symptoms at a certain level you're called a diabetic and you're called always a diabetic whereas your yeah. point is exactly right you've always been you've always had that same propensity where is right. the point that you say I'm a diabetic it nothing really changed except the condition that brought out your symptoms yeah, I think it has something to do with the fact that the diagnosis is so late in the disease because the disease of hyper, hyperinsulinemia goes on for 10, 15, 20 years before all of a sudden the pancreas is no longer able to keep up with that demand of insulin and then your sugars start to go out of control and then the doctor says, oh, you might be starting to become pre-diabetic. Meanwhile, you've been on the diabetic continuum for 20, 30 years. Mm. So I think that's probably why there's that arbitrary cutoff. The arbitrary cutoff is the pancreas starting to fail and blood sugar starting to rise, but it's a very late marker of the entire pathology of everything. Yes, that makes sense. So Amber, some of the most interesting things from this talk that I gathered were your science and research on brain size and in, in the evolution of humans as a species and that, you know, there are two categories of... Um, of beings, one his is needs more help in feeding itself when it's born, and the other one is uh, you know is fully able to feed itself and care for itself when it comes you know when it when it arrives out of the mother and or out of the egg or whatever. And you say we sort of fall in this gray area between uh, we we are well formed you know, but because our brains continue to grow so big and it becomes a physical problem, we have to be born earlier than we would have. Uh, and, and therefore, I just found that whole discussion completely fascinating. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. So the, the prototypical kind of precocial animal, they're called precocious because they come out and they're already basically like adults. So you might think of a giraffe that's born and then within the day they can start running behind their mother. Or a horse, or yeah. A human, a human mm. certainly can't do that. It takes a whole year for them to be able to walk. But most primates are more precocial. And I think the most useful way to think about humans is that it's not that we are born so helpless because we're the kind of animal that's born helpless and takes time to develop, but because we had to be born early because of our huge heads. Yes. Basically, yeah. I think the idea that most scientists have to explain that is that the the birth canal just couldn't couldn't bear a child that had that fully developed brain that we have. Right. And so we had to be born early. And then that means that we had to develop our brains for a lot longer post-birth than any other animal that we know of. Yeah, another point that you brought up uh, in that Ancestral Health Symposium was that uh, humans are one of the fatter or the fattier uh, mammals uh, on the planet, and or at least of all land mammals. It seems a lot of sea mammals are, uh, have a similar kind of amount of fat on them, and uh, part of that has to do with the, with the, the huge brain size. I mean, we need, we need that fat to be able to provide a ready reserve of energy to be able to supply that 20% of daily energy that the brain sucks up and the other 20% that the heart sucks up. So it's, 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 you know, I suspect that that might be why we're unusual in that not only we're born early and, and develop our brain later on in life, but also or later on in the, in, in the early years, uh, but also the, the, the fact that we carry such large reserves of energy because we're, we really are unusual in that, in that way. 
It's very striking when even a lean human is probably carries three times as much fat as a, any other primate that you would think of. Wow. And we're enculturated to see ourselves as lean when we're lean and don't necessarily notice it. It's only when you take those measurements that you see how bizarrely fat we are. Another part of this lecture, which I found fascinating, was how you talk about the brain's makeup, which is mostly fat, and 40% of that is cholesterol. And you think about how the fat has to get into the brain, and the only way is through ketone bodies, through the blood-brain barrier. Isn't that true? Yes. So there's very little ability for fat to cross the blood-brain barrier. Certain kinds of fat can do it, like DHA. Uh, seems to be able to cross the blood-brain barrier fine. But what seems to happen to actually grow the fat and cholesterol that the brain is made of is that we use ketone bodies to get through the blood-brain barrier and then reconstruct the fat and cholesterol from that. And that means that children have to be not only born in ketosis, but stay in ketosis for a long period of time, over a year, you said, while their brains are growing and developing, and they do. And in a remarkable piece of science that you brought up shows that children can get into ketosis much faster and much more efficiently than adults can. And, and, this, and, and also, if you um, add the, the point that they sleep a lot, and if you think about what happens when we sleep, we're in ketosis. And so sleep may be one of the necessary things for, for us in order to give um, you know, the glucose a rest so we can generate more ketones so we can grow our brains. And I never put the two and two together until I saw you talk about that. That it's maybe an argument for more sleep and, and also a reason why people in ketosis adults, you know, Richard and I, get an hour less sleep a night and, and operate fine than we did when we were glucose burners. Yes. So there seems to be an inverse relationship between how old you are and how easily you can get into ketosis. So very young infants are in mild ketosis all the time. And not only that, but they are able to use those ketones much more efficiently. And then the older we get, the more that drops off. But even an adult gets into ketosis more quickly than any other species. Humans seem to be uniquely ketogenic. If you look at other species, they are in ketosis often during suckling, which corresponds to when their brains are growing. Mm or during periods of low food, and that's why ketosis is often associated with starvation. Mm. So if, you're, if your glucose is low, then there, there is, there's an evolutionary advantage to be able to use an alternate fuel. But in humans, it seems to have taken on a much more prominent role and has become a default metabolic fuel. And I think that is intricately linked to the needs of our brain. And you did a great N1 experiment with your own children on this uh, idea that we should be feeding them meat at a much earlier age. Tell us about that. Well, my youngest child was weaned onto meat. When you say weaned onto meat, do you mean like from breast milk to meat and no veggies, no carbs, no nothing like that? That's right. The first two years of his life, my youngest son had almost no plant vegetation in his diet whatsoever. His first foods were broth on a spoon, liver. He would teethe on bones from steaks. Wow. And he, he quite liked that and was very healthy throughout that. The only reason that he initially tried plants was because he, he started a preschool when he was two and they had fruit snacks. And I thought, well, having a little fruit at daycare probably wouldn't actually hurt him. Yeah. And in fact, he did break out into rashes when he started eating fruit there. So oh. I thought, well, it, he didn't need it before and he doesn't need it now. So yeah. fruit wow. now is limited to birthday parties and special occasions. Yeah, I know that when uh, people go off wheat and grains, sometimes when they do have something that's made from wheat, it's like a wrecking ball going through their system, and it, it mm. just—it's just a massive um, 
uh, attack. So, yeah, massive shock to their system. So um, it, it could be something like that with uh, with him not having any exposure to fruit and all of a sudden having some exposure the uh, the impact is a lot higher than had he had it every day or once a week or you know a small amount of uh, of exposure hormetic effect yeah his sensitivity probably increased so that the effect of the minute toxins that would be mm. there would have more of an impact on him right I had also wanted to say you called it an n equals one experiment but we know that there were many societies until very recently that ate primarily meat and very negligible plant sure. foods in their diet, such as in Inuit, Plains Indians, Mongolians. And so that is a kind of demonstration that we can thrive perfectly well mm. without plants. Yep, the Maasai also. Right. I would contend also that most of our evolutionary history, we didn't have much plant food in our diet. It simply doesn't add very much. It's inconsistently available, and it's not something that we would have relied on. And it's not the nutrient-dense or more nutrient-dense plant life that we had. You, you say in your talk that you know, as we evolved, we didn't have the luxury of all of these uh you know, higher nutrient foods, and there probably there wasn't enough, simply enough calories in enough food that we could grow to be able to sustain ourselves. That's right. So, animal biologists have a phrase, high quality diet, and that means meat. There's no mincing of words there. Plants mm. are full of fiber. There's so much you have to eat in order to get the nutrients out of a plant that you have animals like a baboon who have enormous guts to process all that extra fiber. Um, they actually are, are using their guts to get fat out of the fiber by bacteria processing of it. But the nutrients are not very available and they are often bound up with other compounds so that mm. they're not accessible and then even if you can get to the nutrients that are in plants, they're often not exactly the form that we need them in. So people might say, oh, spinach is high in iron. Not only is that iron that's in spinach bound up in oxalates, but when you get it, it's not heme iron. Mm -hmm. So it's not the efficient form that we would make the best use of. It's, it's much more limited. I had an argument once with a vegan and they started it. So I don't go around picking arguments. So just so you know. <laughs> And, you know, I, was, I wasn't I was talking about my ketogenic diet or low carb. I was doing low carb at the time and I was eating some meat and, you know, I just got the kind of disdainful comment or something. And I said, you know, humans were born to eat meat. And this vegan said, no, no, they weren't. No, we weren't. We were designed, our bodies were designed to uh, to have plants. And I said, well, do you have any proof of that? And she says, well, you know, this study or that study. And, and she says, do you have any proof of the fact that we're born to eat meat. And I said, yep, because I like it. <laughs> you know? There is something to that. Yeah. My body says, I smell meat and I want it. That's <laughs> That should be proof enough. <laughs> the fact that children are well known for disliking vegetables ought to tell you something. Why would we have yeah. evolved an aversion to something that's naturally good for us? It, it makes It gives one pause at the very least. <laughs> I know the food when I was first weaned that I that I loved the most was lamb's brains. Now I, I can't tolerate them now, but that was apparently what I craved as a child. What a lucky baby. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm not sure I, I've I, even had opportunity to taste that yet. They're in tomato sauce. Lamb's brains and tomato sauce. You used to be able to buy them by the can. I don't think they're even available these days anymore. It's a, it's an archaic Australian food. <laughs> hmm. Sounds awful. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to admit, I do eat vegetables because I don't like eating liver. Yeah. You know, I know that it's a nutritional powerhouse, uh, but I do, I, I, I just do not like the taste of it. And, uh, and so I avoid eating, I, I guess I eat a lot of skin and a lot of uh, bone broths and uh, yeah, that's really where I get my connective tissue from. Mm. But, but um, I've not gone back to brains. I was only a zombie between one, age one and two. Zombie are my favorite undead. <laughs> <laughs>
One thing that I discovered after my health improved drastically by leaving out vegetables, I had thought initially, I'm in good health despite not eating vegetables. But I later came to understand that vegetables are not actually necessary for health the way that we have been told. Mm. Everyone, I think, who is on a ketogenic diet has had to face the fact that it is not the conventional wisdom. It's against the conventional wisdom to eat a lot of fat. And we have taken a lot of lessons from the science that was behind vilifying fat was based on epidemiological studies. Right. And it turned out there was no real evidence that it was harmful for us. We've spoken about that a, a lot here. Mm. The same happens to be true about vegetables. We're told that vegetables are important for our health and good for us, but all of the science that that is based on is epidemiological. And it turns out there is no basis for that belief that we can point to to say we need vegetables in our diet. And so I want people to know that it's safe not to eat vegetables and it may actually benefit them. If they're eating, you know, low carbohydrates and high fat. The uh, thing that stuck out to me there was uh, people will come up to me all the time and worry that I'm not eating fruit, you know, and I say, well, you know, fruit is actually not good for me and my metabolism. And they'll say, but it's a rich source of antioxidants. And here's my reply. You know why your body needs so many antioxidants? Because you're so freaking oxidized. That's why. <laughs> exactly. And I'm not. A ketogenic metabolism is endogenously antioxidant. You yes. don't need to get them from the outside because you're producing so much antioxidant inside your body. Yeah, it's the same with the, uh, the carb-burning vitamin pushers. I'm sorry, but I'm coming up with names for you people. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I feel the same way about people who eat fiber so that they can uh, dull the impact of the glucose that comes with it. You know? Right. <laughs> or, or, or people who who eat uh, eat high vitamin C with their high glucose food because you know, again, those two compete. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. If you don't eat a lot of glucose, you don't need a lot of vitamin C. And and I eat I eat fruit. I eat uh, capsicum or uh, bell peppers, as they call them in America. Yeah. And they're extremely high in vitamin C. They just mm -hmm. don't have a lot of sugar in. So. Tomatoes also. Well, that's one of the questions I get a lot. Where do I get my vitamin C? Because it's known mm. to be higher in fruit. People talk about curing scurvy with citrus fruit, for example. But it's right. also well known, it was well known by Arctic explorers that meat, it, fresh meat itself would cure scurvy. There's enough in there mm -hmm. to provide your needs, especially if you're not competing using glucose. So does that meat have to be uh, raw or, or will there still be vitamin C in the cooked meat? If it's completely cooked or completely dried, that would not provide enough, probably. Mm. I, do, I don't think it has to be raw. I do sometimes eat raw meat, but even if you're just eating it medium, that should be enough. Mm. We also evolved uh, as a species close to water. And uh, in talking with Marty Kendall about nutrients that are vital, it seems like you know oily fish has been a part of our diet for a long, long, long time as human beings. And then as we moved away from the water and more inland and began to uh, exist more on land animals, uh, our diet changed a little bit. But we still have that requirement for, you know, for fish oil and the things that it provides. How, how does that uh, jibe with the research you've done? I think that the point about seafood can be important, but one point that's overlooked is the role of eating organs and in particular eating brains. As Richard mentioned, <laughs> um, they happen to be full of things that we need for our brains for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> and, and those things, for instance, DHA might be brought up a lot because it's very high in seafood. It's hard to get in other meat but it is high in brains. And so that might be one explanation of mm. why we were able to survive inland even without the access to the seafood. I think I might have craved it as a child because in that particular period, my brain was growing so quickly. And so mm. I would have craved these nutrients as part of the necessary substrate for building up my brain. So uh, at least that makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, as practical advice, I don't know. I like Nina Teichel's advice who says, hide it in meatballs. 
Yeah. I've tried that with my children and they didn't, they weren't fooled. <laughs> well, but your youngest still loves liver to this day, you wrote, right? That's true. It's one of his favorite foods. Good for you. This is great. Um, we could go on and on and I, and I hope to have you back again because there's so much more to talk about, but we're going to link to your blogs and your, your videos and your critical research. And uh, wow, what can I say? Thanks, Amber. Thank yeah, you thank so you much for much. having me. What a great opportunity. Thank you. All right. Well, that was amazing. Yeah, that was great. How good is it to speak to another geek? Yeah. You know, again, it, it seems like the engineers among us are actually looking at the research and, and doing the science and or at least uncovering the science and applying it. And I think that's great. Yeah, I think it's because we don't appeal to authority. So we don't say, you know, just trust me, I know what I'm talking about. I'm a doctor. We go back to first principles and work it all out from, from the get go. And so we make sure that we've we have a rough idea what we're talking about before we yeah. make any any assertions. Yeah, so. very good. All right, then it's time for recipes. 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 <laughs> you first, my friend. Okay, I have the perfect recipe for a carnivore. Yeah. So my recipe today is uh, I'm going to make noodles out of shrimp. What? I know. <laughs> noodles out of shrimp. Whoa. And I'm going to use a technique. Now, this technique came from Wiley Dufresne, and he is a uh, chef from New York, from the East Village, and his restaurant is WD50, and I'll, I'll, I'll include links to his website. Great. Now, this particular recipe, what you're going to do is you're going to take some green shrimp, or green prawns, and you're going to shell them and you're going to put all of the shells in a pan with a little bit of oil, say macadamia, something that doesn't have a lot of uh, flavour, an oil that doesn't have a lot of flavour. By green shrimp, do you mean raw shrimp? Yeah, raw shrimp. Okay. That's right. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to put uh, this in a pan and we're going to cook the, the prawn heads to make what's called prawn head oil. It's like making a stock out of the out of the shells of prawns, but it, like a regular stock takes three or four hours to, to extract. With prawn head oil, it takes maybe 15, 20 minutes. So it's, it's very quick. What you then do is you strain that off and you end up with an orange oil that has a very strong prawn flavor to it or wow. shrimp flavor to it. Great. Now, Take the prawn mince that you've pulled out of these uh, shells and put it in a, in a food processor and blitz it, really blitz it fine. Yeah. And then push it through a drum sieve and uh, that is going to produce an extremely fine puree. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take that puree and we're going to add an enzyme called transglutaminate to that uh and it's otherwise known as meat glue. Oh, yeah. Meat glue. You've probably heard people glue together uh, like a piece of salmon and a piece of beef and then cook them. Right. And it basically turns it into one single piece of meat, half one half is salmon and the other, the other <laughs> half is uh, is lamb or whatever. Welcome to Franken food. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, so what meat glue does or transglutaminase is it cross-links two particular proteins, lysine and glutamine. And so if you have proteins that have lysine and glutamines in them, it will join them together and basically become really one large mass of meat. And so now what we do is we, uh, we're we going to add to this fine puree a little bit of the prawn head oil, not all of it, just maybe half of the prawn head oil that you've made and about a 1% mix of uh, uh, transglutaminase and the RM version is the one specific for uh, seafood and red meats. RM version? Yeah, there's TG hyphen RM is the kind of transglutaminase. Okay. And so, um, but there's there's like five different kinds of transglutaminase, and they're specific to different kinds of protein. All right. So, but this one is specifically good for seafood. So, you add a one percent mix. So, if you uh, if you have a hundred grams of uh, prawn meat, you're going to add about a gram of uh, of this enzyme. Hmm. So we've added the enzyme, put a bit of salt in as well, and uh, you probably want to taste it before you add the enzyme if you're going to taste it. But yeah. Of course, it's raw prawn. Raw prawn meat, you probably don't want to eat that. It's going to taste yummy. Yeah, it'll taste fine. So um, the thing about this this 
enzyme is it, it will link a lot of different kinds of proteins together. So you really wash your hands afterwards, otherwise you might find yourself stuck. Oh. Um, yeah, you stick your fingers together or stick your hand to the side of your face. Or oh, wow. <laughs> these kinds of things. So, yeah, um, yeah, pull off a layer of skin when you Yikes. separate them. So, so make sure you wash your hands afterwards. But what you're going to do now is you're going to put this into a piping bag snip the end off the piping bag to the size of the noodles that you want to produce and get a pot of water up to 55 degrees Celsius. It's about 130 Fahrenheit. Then basically what you do is you uh, extrude this um, puree of shrimp into the 55 degree Celsius uh, water and it probably only takes maybe three or four minutes and it'll harden up and uh, you can basically fish it out with a slotter spoon and then so and then put, I put them on a tray with some cling wrap over the top and, and just let them sit until I'm ready to serve. Now, when you want to serve, what I did was I made a sauce with the remainder of the prawn head oil. I added that plus a little cream and made a creamy sauce. Oh yeah! And then poured that over the top of the uh, and warmed warmed up the noodles and poured that over the top of the noodles. And so made a made a basically a bowl of shrimp noodles in a creamy shrimp head oil sauce. Oh my gosh. And that's my recipe for the day. And so these, do they have the consistency of al dente noodles? Absolutely. Absolutely. Really? It's like a noodle shaped prawn. Yeah, I get it. Wow. Mm. That sounds fantastic. Well, I also have a seafood recipe, Richard, and oh, yeah? this has proven to be delicious, delicious, delicious. And uh, it's my keto clam chowder. 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 That's a very Australian way of saying it, chowder. Well, it's actually a very Yankee uh, way of saying it too, chowder. Yes, sir. Come up down yeah. east and we'll give you some chowder. I've got to admit, when I visited Boston, I felt very much at home. The, yeah. The accent is almost Australian. I've got to go park the car. Yeah, park you know. the car. Chowder. All right. Well, you know, I was born and raised here in New England, so I'm no newcomer to clam mm -hmm. chowder, and I still live near the ocean. And I grew up on clam chowder, okay? But most of the time, you don't see this on keto menus because of two ingredients. One is flour or starch to thicken it, and mm. the other is diced potatoes. Yeah. And a lot of people don't think they can eat chowder without potatoes, but I'm here to tell you, potatoes don't taste like anything. They, they just have a texture, and that's it. And that's the only thing that you miss. So my clam chowder is all of the good stuff of, about clam chowder, which is reduced clam juice and uh, chopped clams and bacon and celery and butter and heavy cream and mm. bay leaves and fresh tarragon. My mouth's watering. <laughs> all the stuff that you love in a clam chowder. But... None of the potatoes. Instead of potatoes, we're going to use cauliflower. And of course, I know everybody's rolling their eyes. Uh. Cauliflower again. But, you know, when you roast cauliflower, it becomes caramelized and the flavor intensifies. And that's what we really want. We want something that has a, a still of a firm bite, but has more flavor. And so this ends up being more flavorful than clam chowder with potatoes because of the cauliflower. Wow. It doesn't hold it back at all. All right, so here's what you do. You preheat the oven to 300. You chop the cauliflower into small dices. And you want to be careful to discard the small crumbly florets, the stuff that's around the outside, because that will just turn to crumbs. It'll and, burn. Yeah, it'll, not only will it burn, but it'll become crummy. And, you, you know, you mm. want little chunks of cauliflower. So... Yeah, so mostly the stem parts. And any part is fine as long as it holds together and doesn't crumble. So what I do is I put it in a roasting pan or a cast iron skillet, put in three tablespoons of olive oil, a little salt, but you don't necessarily need salt because, as you'll see, it could get really salty here. Mm. And just bake it at 300 for 15, 20 minutes or until the bottoms are a little brown and caramelized. And if you want to stir them a couple of times, that's good too. Now, um, we're going to use some clam juice, and I use about a liter of clam juice. And I got three small cans of clam juice, book binders or another brand, and also a couple cans of sea clams, which totaled a, a cup of clams, but they're also packed in juice. So if I had it to do over again, I probably would start with two liters of clam juice. But with one liter, you're going to reduce it down to a third of a liter. Right. So you put it on the heat, turn it up high, and then reduce it to a third of its size. Now, if you start with 
uh, two liters of clam juice, you want to reduce it to a sixth of its original mm -hmm. uh, volume. And the reason for that is you want to concentrate the clam flavor. And that makes all the difference in the world. So while that's reducing, you take a few uh, celery stalks and chop that into small pieces. Just add them into the clam juice. And also um, bacon that you fry beforehand. You want to chop that up into pieces and also fresh tarragon. Uh, and put that in the clam juice and maybe a little onion powder because you can put onions in if you can tolerate them. I don't seem to be able to. There's too much sugar. But I use onion powder and a couple of bay leaves. You take the cauliflower out. You let that rest a little bit. And when it's reduced down, you add the clams, the butter. Oh, yeah, half a stick of butter. Did I mention that? <laughs> yeah. uh, the cauliflower, about a pint of heavy cream. Bring that to a boil for 30 seconds just to give the cream time to set. And then what you got to yeah. do is remove it from the heat. So you got to cool it. And the reason that you have to cool it is because you're going to thicken it with xanthan gum. And this is a great thickener. Ah, yeah. It's a great thickener, but you can't put it in when the food is hot. And indeed, I dissolve the xanthan gum, uh, one teaspoon of xanthan gum to one teaspoon of olive oil, and dissolve that all together. And then pour that into the cooled uh, chowder, then bring it back to the stovetop and bring it to a boil. And that's when it's really going to thicken. And you can just boil it for 30 seconds or until thick and stirring constantly, add some black pepper. Now, the reason I didn't add salt to the cauliflower is because you've got a lot of clam juice that has salt in it, reduced. Yeah, and the bacon. And the bacon. It might be a little salty, so you really have to just be careful. I mean, for you, it's not a problem because you can handle salt. You're ketogenic. But for um, the carb burners among you who are just looking for a good clam chowder, <laughs> it might be too salty for them. So, Is it a good New England clam chowder? I would say it's the best clam chowder wow. I have ever eaten. And I don't say mm. that lightly. I have eaten clam chowder no. all my life, Richard. Yeah, It's so, because it's so creamy. Most clam chowder is made with milk, right? Yep. This is rich and thick and creamy, and the mm. cl reduced clam juice gives it such a powerful clam flavor. And then on top of that, you know, the thickening with xanthan gum is a perfect complement to the cream. It comes out silky and thick. And oh, I've got to try that. Oh my God, is this so good? And the fresh tarragon, of course, uh, adds a, a, an herbaceous flavor. You can also use thyme, fresh thyme. Um, any, sure. any, in fact, any herbs that you want to add really um, complement the clams. Now, I should mention for any Aussies who are trying to replicate this recipe, clam juice is not very common here. Right. So you might want to take some vongolet, which is an Italian uh, small shelled mollusk, or mussels. You have green lip mussels from New Zealand or uh, or pippies. You know, it's very common in Australia for kids to go down the beach and, and use their feet to, to, to pull up pippies from the from the uh the water's edge and so you could do that and um you could use uh you basically make a stock out of them and so mm. you're basically going straight to the reduced um uh the reduced clam juice uh, by making a, a, a thick stock of uh of these uh mollusks yeah i would love to see a uh, a recipe where you did this with pippies yeah or uh anything else that you could find in the grocery store mm. clam wise well, that's it, Richard. Yeah, if you've got anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something that you don't agree with, or some more research that you've found to support or refute what we've said, send it by email to dudes at 2 dudes.com or post it on our website. And you can follow us on Twitter at 2 dudes, on Instagram at 2 dudes, And of course, if you want to join our Facebook community, it's fb.2keto.com. Keep calm and keto on, Richard. Yeah, keep calm and keto on, Carl. All right, and we'll see you next time on Two Keto Dudes. Two Keto Dudes.